Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Yorona Elon, director of the S.J. Carnot Jewish Studies Program and associate professor of Jewish and Middle Eastern Studies at the College of Charleston. And I'd like to welcome you to another Jewish Studies event. Before I hand this over to our host, let me just remind you all that uh, tonight's talk is part of a long series of events that our program is hosting this semester, all virtual and all free. Uh, for example, next Tuesday, the 16th at 7 p.m., we will be discussing the challenges Israeli Ethiopians have had to face um, in Israel with Professor Don Seaman of Emory University. Then on Sunday, the 21st at 1 p.m., we will be discussing Jewish white supremacy and how it affected and still affects Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews. So information about these and all future events and links to register via Zoom are found on our website at jewish.cfc.edu slash events and on our Facebook page. And the links to these will appear in the chat shortly. Uh, now for tonight's event, I shall turn this over to Dr. Ashley Walters, assistant professor in our program and director of the Perlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture, which is also the sponsor of tonight's event. Ashley, please. Thank you, Yaron. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm so happy that you're taking a moment out of your busy schedules to join us on a Thursday night. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Kim Browdy. She's Associate Director for Community Relations um, for the college's uh, Jewish Studies program. Also, a hearty thanks to the Pearlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture, as well as to our many co-sponsors, the Avery Research Center for African American Heritage and Culture, uh, the Jewish Studies program, the African American Studies program, as well as Southern Studies program. We had quite a lineup. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things before we introduce our guest of honor, Bakari Sellers. Our plan is for me to talk with Bakari for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we will begin to take questions from the chat box, which Kim and I will be moderating. So we'd like you to type your questions there, and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can in one hour. Uh, we try and aim for a more personal uh, Q&A session. So if you can, when it's time to um, ask your question, we'd like to give you the opportunity to ask it yourself. If this isn't possible, that's totally fine. We're perfectly happy to read the question for you. We are recording this session uh, to make it available online afterwards. So to help us avoid any unintended audio, please make sure your microphone is muted. Um, and so if you could now just go ahead and mute yourselves if you haven't already. Um, so let's turn now to our guest of honor. I'm not sure our guest needs much of an introduction, but I'd be remiss not to share uh, Bakari's really remarkable story with you. Uh, Bakari was born into an activist family. He is the son of civil rights leader Cleveland Sellers. Uh, who instilled core values in him to continue in the tireless commitment to service. In, 20, er, in 2005, Bakari earned a bachelor's degree in African American studies from Morehouse College, and he continued his education at the University of South Carolina's School of Law and earned his JD in 2008. He currently practices law with the Strom Law Firm in Columbia, where he heads the firm's strategic communication and public affairs team. Uh, Bakari made history in 2006 um, by being elected to the South Carolina State Legislature as the youngest African-American elected official in the nation at the age of 22. Uh, his political career didn't stop there. In 2014, he was the Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor in the state of South Carolina. And he's also worked uh, alongside US Congressman James Clyburn and former Atlanta Mayor Shirley Franklin. Um, his accomplishments have not gone unnoticed in the Democratic Party. In 2008, he served on President Obama's South Carolina Steering Committee. He's also been named Time Magazine's 40 Under 40, as well as the Route 100 list of the nation's most influential African Americans in 2015, as well as the HBCU's Top 30 Under 30 in July 2014. 
and he's been featured as a speaker at all sorts of uh, various political events, universities, uh, as well as the 2008 and 2016 Democratic National Convention. Uh, Seller, uh, Bakari is married to his wife, Dr. Ellen Rucker Sellers, and is the proud father of two adorable twins, Sadie and Stokely. Um, and then the reason, one of the things that brings us here tonight, we're very excited to have Bakari talk about his New York Times bestseller, uh, My Vanishing Country, a memoir. So please join me in welcoming our guests tonight. I'm so honored to be speaking with you. Got to unmute myself. I know my wife <laughs> at the mute button in the house, but um, it's a privilege. And coming from the big city of, of Denmark, where we have three host stoplights and a blinking light, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, my mom and dad always told me the two most important words in the English language were the words thank you. And they're not nearly said enough. And so I just want to say thank you for having me. It's a big night for me. I just got finished speaking to the uh, um, ID Quincy School um, at the University of South Carolina. Um, in their department of social work named after uh, Senator Ida Quincy Newman, who was one of the first African-Americans elected to the South Carolina State Senate uh, since uh, Reconstruction. Um, and so, um, you know, it's an honor to be here with you all today. This was circled on my calendar. The only thing uh, that I wish is that I'm an extrovert. I wish we were able to be there in person um, so I could go to Husk after this. Um, and <laughs> Good and drink good and hang out with all of you all. So, uh, and please, guys, there are such things as stupid questions, but don't let that hold you back. Ask me anything you want to ask me. Um, I'm only been in, I'm only 36 years old, haven't been in politics yet long enough to lie to you. So I know people are, are 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 thinking about a lot, and no matter how challenging the question is, I'll do my best. So please be thinking about some good questions, and I hope this is a very productive dialogue over the next uh, 51 minutes. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, well, um, I'll start us off with some questions and that'll give you all time to put your questions in the chat box. So Bakari, as I was reading your memoir, I was thinking to myself, where does one possibly begin with a story like yours? Your book has been described as part memoir and part historical and cultural analysis illustrating the lives of America's forgotten black working class men and women. And I think it is indeed all these things and so much more. So we have a lot to unpack tonight, but I think the best place to begin is um, to just ask you what prompted you to write this memoir? Why now? Why at the age of 34 or 35 did you feel it was time to tell your story? So I, I First of all, in order to run for office, you have to have some dose of psychopathy. I recognize that, <laughs> but I'm not insane enough to believe that I should be writing a memoir at 30 years old. That was not something, that was not an idea of my own volition. I did not come out and say, I'm gonna write a memoir because my life has been so dope at 30 years old that I am going to have this great memoir. So this is a little known secret about my vanishing country. I was turned down over 30 times, about 31, 32 times to write this book because I wasn't trying to write a memoir. Um, I was trying to write a political book. I wanted to write a book about being progressive, being young, being black in the South during the age of Trump. That was my goal. Um, and nobody wanted to buy the book. I wrote sample chapters. I had you know, all of these treatments done, everything. We sent it off multiple times. We had, you know, different sets of treatment, sent it off to different publishing houses, and nobody wanted to buy the book, literally 32 times. The, this, is, this is the only thing that My Vanishing Country has in common with The Wrinkle in Time, because The Wrinkle in Time was also turned down, I think, between 31, 32 times, <laughs> and so was My Vanishing Country. So I, Tracy Sherrod, who is one of the only Black women who had a publishing house, she's over Amistad, which is a HarperCollins imprint. She said, Bakari, let's go eat breakfast. And again, I am... I am a country boy, I'm from Denmark, right? Where we still go to the We Bake on Wednesday and Thursday because they have these amazing apple fritters that we go and get, you know, it's just, you know, that's who I am. And so she takes me to this nice fine dining breakfast spot in New York and she sits across the table from me and she's like, tell your story. And I tell her who I am and I talk about, you know, my father getting involved in the movement at 10 years old after the um, lynching of Emmett Till. I talk about um, the Orangeburg Massacre. I talk about running for office and the highs and lows of that. I talk about, um, uh, you know, being the youngest elected official in, in the country and 
my relationship with the 44th president of the United States. I, I talk about Charleston um, and the impact that, you know, my friendship with Clem um, uh, and, and his, his um, brutal uh, murder in, in Mother Emmanuel Amy Church, along with eight others, how that impacted me. This was before um, my children were born, et cetera. And she said, you know, you got to write this. And I said, write what? She said, you have to write the story. And so we began to write it. Um, and, you know, the, the pretty cool part about this, Ashley and Kim, is I am, um, I think I'm the only New York Times bestseller from Denmark. So <laughs> they got to put a sign in front of the city or something. They got to <laughs> like, oh, that the home up. That's what I want. No, I, but it was a, you know, it was a really, really cool experience. Um, I did not set out to write a memoir. And the other thing is this, for all of you individuals who, I see some names of people out here who should have already written written books or should be writing books. I won't call their names, but I see some out there. Um, one, you when you write a book, you never know you never know what's going to be going on in the world when your book is released. I didn't know that after my book came out on the birthday of Malcolm X, May nineteenth, that about ten days later, the world would see imagery of um, another black man being. I mean, I could predict that it, it was going to happen, but I didn't know that it was going to be George Floyd or the way that it happened. I didn't know when I was talking about the poverty and the lack of access to quality health care or the implicit biases we have in our healthcare delivery system or the lack of access to potable water or um, you know, all of these institutionalized um, levels of oppression we have, systemic levels of oppression we have in our country that we would be in, in the middle of a pandemic. I didn't, didn't know these things. I literally did an, a book tour sitting right here in the same spot. Um, I, I tell people I, I, I had a bestseller and went on a book tour and I didn't even have to wear pants. This is where we were in the country, right? I mean, it was just, it was this type of environment and you never know when you write a book when it's going to be released. And so this book came at the right moment in time. I mean, it's just, um, God works in mysterious ways. And so it was a, it was a, it, it was just perfect for the moment. And um, I'm really proud that the paperback comes out in a, in a couple of months. And um, we're just excited. It's coming out in um, Spain um, and it's coming out in Germany um, as well over the next couple of weeks. So it's been doing really well. Wonderful. Um, so kind of building off some of the themes you just uh, mentioned there, I think one of the really striking things about your book is the, the generational histories you tell, the kind of moving between your father's generation and the movement that really defined his generation and then the, our contemporary era and what's going on as you're writing this book and as you say, as the book is coming out. So you are the son of Cleveland Sellers, a legend of the civil rights movement. And it's clear that his uh, legacy of activism and social justice has impacted your life. Uh, the feminist writer and speaker Rebecca Walker uses a phrase, maybe she coined it, I don't really know, but she describes herself as a movement child, which is just so haunting and beautiful and just has so much meaning in just two words. And I think she's implying something a bit different because she's talking about being the child of an interracial family. But I think the phrase really captures how the children of civil rights movements and leaders haven't been impacted by their parents' fight for justice. Um, and so you were introduced to that world through your father. You talked about um, the importance of going to Morehouse and how pivotal pivotal that was. Um, so how I'm curious how how this legacy shaped your life in particular, um, given that you were born kind of after this era had come to an end, if it's fair to say that. I I will push back on the framing of the question, but I will say this: I will say that yes, I am a child of the movement. We 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 refer to ourselves as that. Um, it's a small club, but it's a unique club. It's a unique <laughs> club, and we're very proud to have parents who, um, some of which, um, you know, I talked to Bernie. I was talking to Bernice King earlier. Some of which who uh, gave what Abraham Lincoln called the the last full measure of devotion for this country, um, and it's just an awesome. You know, my father. I I, I tell folk all this all the time. Right now, we're living in an interesting time because people are confusing patriotism with pa prejudice with patriotism all the time. Um, I think we saw that on January 6th. And, um, you know, I remind folk all the time that the blood of my family literally runs through the soil of this great country. So I feel like I have every right to push this 
imperfect country to be that much better, right? The country I love, I feel like we have that right to push it to be that much better. Um, and so I push back on the framing of your question because my father and I aren't a part of separate movements. Like the struggle didn't end. It may be a comma, right? But it's not a period. Um, and so I think the greatest indictment on where we are, I think the greatest indictment on the United States of America is what I told Melissa Harris Perry in front of Mother Emanuel AME Church um, on a Saturday morning is that at the time I was 30 and my father was 70 and we're having too many of the same shared experiences. You know, a lot of people, they're like, there are two things. One, can we start healing? And can we, when do we get to forgiveness is kind of wild to me because no one wants to have accountability or atonement. That's first. But, but people oftentimes challenge me and say, Bakari, why are we having these conversations about race? That time has passed. That time is long gone. You don't have the same burdens of a generation before. And that is intellectually lazy and dishonest because it, it's absent the historical context that we all know to be true. My father literally went to segregated schools. Like this isn't something that is far beyond in history books from hundreds of years ago. You know, I actually have a passage in, in um, my vanishing country where I outline a portion of his history textbook that talked about the Negro, right? I don't have a book with me. It's a really interesting passage, but, um, you know, we, we outline that. I, I talk about um, where my father had, had Emmett, my father had Megger, uh, my father had Henry Smith and Samuel Hammond and Delano Middleton. You know, I have Tamir Rice, um, I have Walter Scott, I have Eric Gardner, I have Sandra Bland, I have George Floyd, where my father had the 16th Street Baptist Church, I have Mother Emanuel. And so, you know, it's very, you, it, it's, it sucks. It's probably the, the most <laughs> plain language you can use. But it also shows if we wanted to have it, a higher level of discourse and verbiage, it also shows the perpetual state of grieving that is the black experience in this country and the correlation between these generations and how that movement, there's not a period there, it's a continuation thereof. And so watching my father struggle and people have to fully contextualize and understand this because it wasn't just that my father was shot on February 8th of 68. It wasn't just that Henry Smith was a good friend of his who was killed. It wasn't that two others that night, one was, none of them were older than 19 and one was actually a senior at Wilkinson High School whose mother actually was a, a custodian at the campus and every night he would go and walk her home um, after work. It wasn't that my father was arrested when he got to the hospital and it wasn't even um, that he was uh, housed on death row after his bond was denied. Ironically, for the first and only time in this state's history, I-26 between Orangeburg and Columbia was completely shut down that evening when he was escorted out to Pink Castle and he went to Broad River Correctional. And he had, this is kind of weird, but this is a, also an ancillary note. One of the most uh, weird uh, figures in South Carolina history is a, is a man named Pee Wee Gaskin. I don't know how many of you all know the story of Pee Wee Gaskin, but it's a fascinating story. I, I challenge all of you all to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> Uh, on the internet, he is, he was one of the most notorious figures ever in South Carolina. My father was actually uh, on death row near him at, at the time. Um, and they housed him there while his bond was denied because he was viewed to be an outside agitator. It wasn't that he went to trial. It wasn't that his indictment was backdated. And while we're having all of these conversations about incitement and rioting, my father literally went to prison for rioting. He was the first and only one man riot in the history of this country. It wasn't that my, my, sister was born while my father was in prison. All of our names are Swahili. Her middle name is Abadame. It means born while father's away. Um, it wasn't that my father literally had a felony in the South and couldn't get a job. And my mother had to carry the entire family for an generation. You're talking about my brother and sister, not I, but my brother and sister growing up in a family where government assistance was there simply because your father was wrongfully convicted for an, un, uh, for an injustice, right? I mean, and everybody knew this, this wasn't like a secret. Um, it wasn't that he, it took him until 1990 to get pardoned. I think the thing that's the most damning is that nobody knows the story. Like we can get through all of the injustices along the way, we can get through the struggle, but just the fact that our history has been overwritten, like our, our history has been whitewashed. And nobody knows those stories. Children in South Carolina don't, 
don't know the names Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton. If you were to go out in the street right now and ask folk, where are you from? And they say South Carolina, and you say those three names, they'd be like, oh, are those the new recruits at Clemson of Carolina? Like no one knows the meaning um, of what that is. And I think that that's the greatest tragedy that we have. And so for me growing up, I live with that chip burden struggle and it motivates me so much. Um, there's a lot of angst and anxiety that comes with that. I talk about that in the book, but it also motivates me to attempt to create a world so that my children grow up without that perpetual state of grief and to break that cycle. Um, you, in the um, book, you talk about the Orangeburg massacre and the impact it's had on your life in addition to your father's. Um, it's a particularly poignant moment in the memoir, I think. Um, and I think it raises really interesting questions about the collective memory of trauma and its impact on subsequent generations. Uh, we talk about this a lot in Jewish history and the impact of the Holocaust on second and third generation survivors, a really understudied demographic. And I think, um, I think it, it makes me wonder how we should begin to approach trauma experienced by communities like the Black community, the Jewish community, and others. Uh, you say in your memoir that you think in many ways Orangeburg has had more of an impact on you than your father. And I'm curious if you could um, just talk a little bit about how you see that in yeah. your life. And I want to answer your question directly. I think how we unpack the trauma. I can diagnose the number one ill of our country right now. Mm -hmm. I And I'm going to break. This is like I need a cry on, like a CNN breaking news cry on. I, I need to have <laughs> wolf out here with me so wolf can say that we now we're going to go to Bukhari Sellers for breaking news. But we, we have an empathy deficit in our country. I mean, period. I mean, that's it. <laughs> that's the diagnosis. Like we, we literally have an empathy deficit and a lot of it has to do with the fact that we retreat to our own silos and we seek out news and, and opinion that only reinforce our own news and opinions. And even more, when you're talking about two cultures like the black culture and Jewish culture, you, you realize that you can't be selfish in your struggle. And that's what I tell folk all the time. There has to be some sense of empathy. There has to be this selflessness in your struggle, understanding that you can identify, that you understand uh, that you want to walk that extra mile with someone, not for someone, because I don't know anybody asking for a handout, right? But you can walk that extra mile with someone. When I mentioned that my that haunts me more than my father, because my father is at peace, you know, that comes with age, I think, or wisdom or something, or red wine. I have no idea what it comes with, but I'm not there yet, right? And so I'm working diligently to attempt to right the wrongs of yesterday, to remedy the ills, to create a more perfect union, and to make sure people realize that the efforts of my father and many more were not in vain. Um, you know, I, I and, and this is, this is both a political, but even more importantly, a moral struggle. I think that people oftentimes get turned off when they look at the politics of the issue because they're, they're, politics does matter, but let's set that aside right now. We're having a moral struggle in our country. We're having a defining moment about not what's conservative or what's progressive or liberal or whatever the title you wanna put, but we're having a basic discussion about what's right and what's wrong. We're having a discussion about what the fundamental tenets of democracy truly means. We are facing an issue right now that I truly believe is one of a moral conscience, nothing more, nothing less. And that requires us to have a level of empathy. And the reason we're struggling and tackling these issues is because we have that empathy deficit. And that's been quite evident because of the, 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 the very low level dialogue we've been having um, for the past few years. Yeah, I want to I want to build off of the empathy deficit point because I think this is really critical, and um, I I think one way to do this is to perhaps talk a little bit about Denmark, but places that are um, kind of like Denver, Denmark but very different. So um, bear with me here. I'm going to try and. Um, get us all up to speed. So I think your book offers a really striking portrait of racial inequality where there's a whole lot of class inequality. And you mentioned how public perceptions of black poverty tend to conjure up images of urban poverty, but you write about a very different setting. You give this um, Denmark 
new visibility, which I think is really crucial. Um, and I think in a way the rural poverty you describe seems to almost be colorblind and correct me if I'm misinterpreting it, but the poverty you describe in Denmark sounds, sounds very different than the kind of inequality you see in say Mount Pleasant, for example. Um, and feel free to um, correct me if I'm wrong. I've never been to Denmark, um, future goals. Um, but you know, I asked this because I grew up in a town in rural Western New York. So your hometown had three stoplights. My hometown doesn't have any. So I come from a very uh, rural area um, that kind of resembles the rural rust belts of say what J.D. Vance described in Hillbilly Elegy, um, which is book your book is often compared to perhaps um, that's not a fair comparison. So I'm struck, I'm struck by how conservative politicians like Trump really resonate in poor white communities like the ones where I came from, where there isn't really a race question. And it's very hard to get people coming from these communities to identify with a race question, to identify with the idea of Black Lives Matter, because it seems to them that their lives don't matter. Um, they're living lives too that feel very difficult and they don't have the ability to really empathize with what other people are facing. And I think this is why Trump resonates so well in some of these places. And so when you're, when you're representing a place like Denmark or you're trying to think of a message that perhaps gets people on the same page, gets them to think about people who they don't normally see, how do you do that? So one, I think that, uh, I think that colorblind is a is a not a good phrase to use when we're having discussions about race. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want anyone on this call to think they can walk away and be colorblind about anything, unless you truly are colorblind. I don't. I don't really want um, anyone to say I don't see race. Right. I think that's a cop out. I want you to see me for who I am. I want you to see the entire virtue of my diversity and the value that that diversity brings to the table. And so when people say that they're colorblind or they don't see race, many times the way that it's read or interpreted or even meant from the person who's saying it is that it devalues, whether or not it's intentional or not, the experience that we bring to the table that is an experience that is um, um, by virtue of who we are. So you brought up a good point about Trump. And I actually think that Trump and Bernie Sanders had a great deal in common when it came to this vein of populism. That's it, that's the loan kind of what they had in common. But I do think that this wave of populism swept, it wasn't just in the United States. You saw this wave of populism in Canada. You saw this wave of populism in the UK with Brexit. We see how that played out. We saw this wave of populism. I mean, you even saw Hamas talking about it. Where they even ran on a platform talking about a, a chicken in every pot. Right? It's the most corrupt regime in the history of, of, of global government. But here you are, you know, running an election on populism, right? And now everybody knows that was complete and utter BS, right? So even you, it's not something that at the time you saw it in Germany, although Angela Merkel was able to push back on that wave of populism. You saw that rise around the world. And there was a certain tenor speaking to individuals who felt like this country had passed them by. Now, Ashley, I will also tell you this. I do not believe in economic anxiety. I don't think that's a thing. I think it's a, I think it's words that we created, but I don't necessarily believe that to be the case. I think that there is a certain level of cultural angst and cultural anxiety. And I think we need to acknowledge that. I think that there are individuals who think that people are replacing them. I think that there are individuals who believe that, and they are, they are afraid rightfully or wrongfully, that the browning of America is taking their jobs, the browning of America is taking whatever they view to be their culture to be, the browning of America and that diversity, instead of tapping into it and understanding and understanding how we are a more perfect union for it, we've had people in media and running for president and everything else who preyed on those differences to drive us further apart. And I think that that cultural angst, you hear it all the time, you see it all the time. This is why, so the, the, there are a couple of things that are, that are fascinating to me. Whenever you see unabashed racism, you are very likely to see coupled together unabashed anti-Semitism, right? 
And Bakari, give me an example of what you're talking about. January 6th, it was wild to me that what stuck out, one of the things that stuck out was there was a guy running through the Capitol with the Confederate flag. He was next to a guy who had a shirt on that was 6MWE. Six million wasn't enough. It was, it, if you were to take in a picture of these individuals, it was representative of the most vile hate that we could see in the underbelly of our country all rolled up into one. And the unique thing about all of this, and I hope that we're able to peel back another layer, when you look at Charlottesville and you look at January 6th, what stuck out to you the most? It wasn't the racism, it wasn't the anti-Semitism. It was the fact that nobody wore a hood. Nobody covered their faces, right? They were unashamed. So these issues that we're dealing with for a very long, they've been here since before Trump, they've been here since before I was born. These, are, these, are, these issues have been here for a very long period of time. But we're dealing with a time now where people feel so emboldened that they don't even cover their faces. And so that's where we are as a country. And so we have to begin to put a face on it. We have to begin to hold it accountable. And for those individuals who, as you, you brought up something which is so true that for those individuals who cannot have empathy or do not have a level of understand, understanding, like I, I don't want you to, I, I want you just to be able to have some level of understanding for the experience as I see it in this country. I want you to maybe not, I don't think it's going to make your heart flutter like it makes mine, but some understanding for what I go through thinking now, I, I have a two-year-old black son who one day will be grown and making sure that he is not an 11-year-old boy playing with toy guns outside in the park like, like all these kids do, but doesn't get the virtue of being a child and he's in a box like Tamir Rice. That he doesn't pass a fake $20 bill that he doesn't even know is fake and he has an officer who has their knee on his neck like, uh, like George Floyd. You know, or he's not asleep in his house and police come in serving a no-knock warrant and he's not shot like Breonna Taylor. Or he just don't happen to be, um, you know, in church worshiping on a Wednesday night, you know. So these are the experiences that I don't want you to, I don't want you or expect you to have the same level of emotion that I do, but I do want you to have some certain level of understanding. And I think that's where we have to get to. I don't care if you're from Western New York or you're from Compton, California, like that's humanity. And I think that until we get to a certain point where we recognize the common notion and give everyone in this country the benefit of their humanity, that's all black folk want. That's, that's all we ever ask for. We're not asking for nothing else. Just give us the benefit of our humanity and everything else will be just fine, right? Until we get to that point, we are going to continue to struggle with this issue of race, no matter where you're from in this country. I, I'm, I am curious to hear, um, kind of to take that a step forward and see how you see that happening under a new administration, uh, the kind of steps that need to be um, taken to do this, um, you know, your reaction to the um, recent impeachment trials. I know you were on CNN talking about them today, um, but I'd be curious to hear kind of how you see us moving forward, um, whether you're optimistic or. Oh yeah, I'm, 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 I'm always optimistic. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I haven't met a Jewish person or a black person that ain't optimistic. I mean, we've been through so much. Like, <laughs> there's just a certain level of optimism that's inherent in our cultures, right? I tell folk, black folk been here 401 years. I mean, we done seen about everything. So we're not, we not really tripping. I mean, this, <laughs> most black folk to this day would have told you they predicted January 6th. They would be like, oh, we knew this was going. My daddy's like, we knew this was going to happen, right? So, you know, this isn't, this isn't anything new. I mean, you have to have a certain level of perseverance. Um, you you got to be hope. You hear the little voices in my background of no other reason than you got to be hopeful for them, right? So, you know, I I just but hope for me. And this is a lot of the problem that we have. And I think it's kind of weird because I used to always say Democrats were creatures of personality because Democrats used to always want we never fail. Give me the next JFK. 
And then give me the next Bill Clinton. And then, oh my God, I want somebody to make me feel like Barack Obama made me feel. Democrats are really a cult of personality, which is also why we get beat in many elections. We should, <laughs> because instead of working on the electorate, we try to cultivate candidates, which is crazy. We learned that in Georgia. That's not the way you should do it. But now Republicans have become this weird cult of personality. And I say that to say that the change we're seeking, none of this happens in Washington, DC. Absolutely none of it. I mean, the tenor can be set. Yeah, the tone can be set. It's pretty good that I'm on CNN some mornings and I never, the, there's nothing that catches me off guard on TV, except one thing. The one thing that would catch me off guard is when the producer would come in my ear and say, Trump just tweeted, we're about to go to that real quick. We're gonna put it up on the screen. We need y'all to react. I have no idea what he's about to say. That was, your heart drops. Cause you don't know if he's talking about you, which he has done before. You don't know, you just don't know where, where this is going. You, you just don't know. So yeah, we're gonna have some moments where we don't have to worry about Joe Biden tweeting. We don't have to worry about this. We don't have to worry about that. I mean, you get to breathe a little bit. You're Democrat or Republican watching this. There is some, there is some just sense of relief that you'll have some level of normalcy again. But the change we wanna see really happens at a hyper local level. You know, I, I look at our legislature. I mean, we can't even vaccinate 65 year olds, but they done passed the quickest abortion bill I've ever seen in the history of mankind. Like I ain't here to make this a pro-choice pro-life debate, but I'm here to make this a priority debate. You know what they gonna pass next? Open carry. So before we vaccinate people or get kids back in school, Democrat or Republican, you got to look at folk and be like, where are your priorities? Like, I mean, th this is just, this is insane. We still have, I'm 36 years old, Ashley, and you're from Western New York. So this ain't going to rile you up like it's going to rile up. I see Ms. Zucker and many others on this call. I see the Blackmans. We still have a quarter of shame in this, in this, in this state. Kids go to school that were built in 1930 and 40. When Barack Obama was president, we built two schools, one in Dillon and one in Bamberg, and we thought we changed the world. Have you been to the schools in, in Allendale or Blackville? One of the first school shootings we've ever had in the United States is not written about a lot was at Blackville Hilda. And the only reason I know about it is because my dad was on the school board. The reason that they were able to have a school shooting is because Blackville Hilda is one of the schools that's called an open air school. You know what open air means that your hallways are literally outside. It's the most unsafe way for you to go to school. The same school exists. To, it's literally the same school today. Denmark Ola Primary School in 2010 the cafeteria roof collapsed. It didn't make CNN, didn't make MSNBC because it's not atypical. It's the typical condition that kids go to school in. Like the kids literally have to walk through the mud to get to their trailers where they go to school in Denmark. And so I, I want to see unity and hope and I want to see all of that good stuff and Kumbaya has come out of Washington, DC. That's all good. I would just really start with like no more insurrections, just like basic stuff. But I really want to see the change at home. I want to see the activism from our local city councils. I want to see uh, the STEM programs um, in our local schools. I want to see us focus on improving the plight of, you know, you have Denmark Tech and, and South Carolina State that are struggling. I want to see our, our legislature just grab that and, and, and take these things on. I want to see us create new industries. This is where I get a little bit controversial because I really want to see us legalize marijuana or at least medical marijuana. Um, and move towards some sense of gaming. Do you know they're about to pass gaming in Alabama? So, I mean, we can have these political debates. This is when I, I get really too progressive sometimes, but I just think that there are ways that we can create new streams of revenue. And why not have a debate about ideas that aren't archaic? Like, you don't have to agree with me, but let's have ideas about the future, not the ideas, not arguments about ideas from yesterday. Um, so I have some questions coming in that I want to start turning to, um, but I also, because we have a lot of students in the audience, I also would like to um, have you talk a little bit about um, your experience getting into politics and perhaps advice you have for students who are um, interested in politics. But we have several questions about what it's like being a CNN commentator. Um, Eileen Chepanek asks, how did you become a CNN commentator and Dale Rosengarten asked us to have you tell us what it's been like to be a CNN commentator, commentator during Trump's impeachment trial and what's it like on the other side of the media? It, so I was walking um, 
I don't even think the first citizens exist anymore, but you know that first citizens parking lot right down from Mother Emanuel, right across from Francis Marion Square. I was walking there with, um, oh, it was right after this week on CBC. It's, it's, it's George Stephanopoulos' show, but he wasn't ho hosting that week. Um, anyway, I was walking, I got a phone call from a private number and it was the VP at CNN. And they say, we've been watching you all week. We've been watching you for a while now. We want to hire, I literally got hired off the street. And so that's how good my negotiating skills were. They said, we got $15,000. It was June. They wanted to hire me for the rest of the year for $15,000. That meant the check was like $600 a, a month or something like that. I don't, I don't know. And I said, why don't you give me 50? And their response was, we got 15. I said, deal, I'll take 35. <laughs> and they said, we got 15. I signed the contract at $15,000. So that tells you how good my negotiating skills were. Um, the next year I got paid a little bit more and they, they it was, it was um, an election year, it was 2016. I did 250,000 air miles that year. Uh, it was surreal, but I mean, you're on the ground in Iowa and you got to realize like, we went to St. Louis, we had a debate in St. Louis. I was flying in from, I went over to London to give a political talk. Um, I was speaking at APAC London, weirdly enough. I was doing a political talk, APAC in London. And I flew back and we were doing a debate at um, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And it was so surreal afterwards, I'm in the lobby uh, drinking wine with Nancy Pelosi and Anderson Cooper, like that's, that's like your post game show. That's like, that's like, that's like what happens. Uh, you know, we had a debate in Vegas um, and you're, we're all in a cosmopolitan and you have all, it's just, it's, it's a, I'm from a city where we have 3,300 people and every night I speak to a million people. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's a different environment. It's a different experience. When I walk through the airport, I always have my hoodie up. And of course now your mask on because it was not, I would tell folk, it was nothing worse then Bernie bros who would come up because I was not a big Bernie fan and they would they would just let you know everything they were feeling at any given time, no matter where you were, who you were with. Um, and it was just, it's just, you know, it, politics, there's this unique intersection now between sports, entertainment, culture, and politics. Like everybody wants to talk politics now. It's kind of fascinating. And so it, it's been a really cool experience. Talking Trump impeachment is, is, is the easiest thing you'll ever do. Um, I don't know if any times you guys have ever been in trial. I've been in trial many times. I've never known the result of a trial before I've gone through it, but everybody knows the result of this one. Um, that's why everybody was like, I know Butch Bowers really well. They were like, why would Butch take this case? I said, who wouldn't take a case they gonna win, right? Like that you're not getting 17 Republicans to vote for a conviction. By the way, random fact before you ask your next question, Ashley. There have been three impeachments, three, in the history of this country. And in the three impeachments, there has been only one United States Senator, one, to switch parties, in, not switch parties, but to vote against that president's party or that party's president. You know who that one person was? Mitt Romney. This has been one. So now you're gonna have about six or seven in the next go round. Random fact, if you're ever on Jeopardy. <laughs> okay. Um, do we have Maya Sanford? Are you able to ask your question? Maya's one of our students. I like that last name, Maya. Yes, yeah, sorry. Is Mark um, related to you? Sorry? Are you related to Mark? No, I'm not. Oh, you probably get that all the time. Mark just called me the other day. Mark was one of my favorite governors. Mark just called me the other day and Mark said, I was just thinking about you when I was riding down the street. That's the type of person he is. It doesn't make it doesn't make a lot of sense to people, but he's just he was a and sorry, my I'm just rambling real quick. But one time I was at the governor's mansion and we were having a freshman, uh, a freshman. Uh, uh, I was a, just got elected. We were having a freshman lunch at the governor's mansion. By the way, Nikki never invited me to the mansion. I still remember that. I resent that. And Mark pulled me aside and he pulled me to the back. And do you know? Everybody else was out there eating and he talked to me about the Orangeburg massacre for 30 minutes. He was fascinated by the book and he just wanted to talk about it. And ever since then we, and I voted to impeach him, weirdly enough, it was the worst vote of my life. I made a mistake with that one, but go ahead, Maya, I'm sorry. I was wondering how do you think we can improve the empathy deficit you mentioned earlier that we have in the country? Yeah, that's tough. Uh, a lot of it has to do with our consumption of social media and our consumption of cable news. Um, 
And so those two things, I, I, I'm a little too young to be giving y'all homework assignments, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, now, uh, Kim is in charge of making sure everybody does the homework um, and Ashley as well. But I want you guys for the next week to watch Fox and Friends. And then, and then for the following week, watch Morning Joe. And then for the following week, watch New Day. Three straight weeks, every morning, 30 minutes, watch these news programs. And I'm not even telling you to, I don't even know how to pronounce O-A-N-N. -N. I think it's O-N -O or something like that. And I'm not telling you to watch Newsmax, but just watch these three. And you will be kind of surprised by what large swaths of this country are consuming in terms of their news. It will surprise you all. And so I think it's necessary to see what other people are listening to. When I was young, my when I was in school, law school, I used to watch 106 in Park before your time, it was on BET, and the O'Reilly Factor, which is also kind of before your time now. I used to watch the O'Reilly Factor every day because my father would tell me that you have to know what they're saying about you. And I was fascinated by the debate. It taught me so much. It really helped me um, in the South Carolina General Assembly because I could kind of see where they were thinking and how they were thinking. It was like, you know how Tom Brady prepares for a game the night before by watching the opponents? Like, this is what I was doing. And it just, it gave me some sense of understanding. The last thing is we have to learn how to talk to folk. I, I remind people that all, I mean, it's okay to talk to people who are from different places, who think differently, who look differently than you. The person who I learned that with the easiest was a young man who used to run a Confederate museum in South Carolina. We all know him, great guy. And he was Episcopalian. I was Episcopalian too. And I read it in, this, in the, the, uh, the uh, manual that we had, the legislative manual. And I knew he had this Confederate museum, but I said, I need to get to know who this person is. And so he also used to watch how to, what is it, how to be a millionaire every night. He would watch it every single night. His name was Glenn McConnell. He happened to be the most powerful person in the state of South Carolina. Glenn and I stuck up, a, we struck up a friendship. The, the son of somebody who was shot in the Orange Room Massacre struck up a friendship with somebody who owned and ran a Confederate museum, all right? And he was able to do things like help me build libraries in Bamberg County without anybody knowing. He was able to do things all because we went out of our way to have conversations with each other. I don't agree with them about everything, but I do respect them. And we do have a certain level of empathy for one another. And he was a, he was a really, really good president in my opinion. Um, do we have Simon Lewis? Simon, are you able to turn on your screen and ask a question? Sure. Um, so, Bakari, you're wearing a, a Morehouse sweatshirt. Yes. Um, can you talk about the value of um, HBCUs? Yeah, you know, thank you for asking that question, Simon. I am a proud graduate of HBCUs. And, um, you know, historically black colleges and universities are reemerging uh, on the mainstream of political thought um, for a very long period of time. And I'm not sure how many people know this, but HBCUs produce the overwhelming majority of black professionals in the country and still today, um, architects, engineers, doctors, lawyers, et cetera. The overarching majority all graduated from historically black colleges. I happened to go to Morehouse, which was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. We've had great alums from Morehouse like Julian Bond, Edwin Moses, David Satcher, Spike Lee, Samuel L. Jackson, um, Martin Luther King, many others. Um, but now when you're looking, when you're talking about that HBCU experience, just to name a few, Joyce Beatty, who's the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, went to Cheney State. Yogananda Pittman, who's the new black woman who's in charge of the United States Capitol Police, went to Morgan State. Kamala Harris went to Howard University. Raphael Warnock went to Morehouse. And they all rode in on the shoulders of Stacey Abrams, who went to Spelman. And so people are starting to see and be able to tell this story now. The cool thing about HBCUs is that they, they place this crown above the head of their students. You know, it's always this level of expectation that you are going to be great, right? And you are going to be able to compete in any environment from Wall Street to Main Street. And fundamentally, you're gonna change the world because you come from, my dad, Ashley was asking me this question earlier about what it means to be a child of the movement. Well, my dad told me 
and my brother and my sister that we could be anything we wanted to be in this world as long as we were change agents. And that's what he taught us. He said, you can go out and if you want to be a doctor, be a doctor, but you got to be a change agent. You're going to be a lawyer, be a lawyer, but you got to be a change agent. And so my sister took that and she does work. She's, she's a doctor at the veterans hospital. She, that's her work to change. You know, I, I um, find myself in politics and doing all these other things. And so that HBCU experience cultivated that level of competition and, and excellence in, in all of us. Thank you for asking that, Simon. Okay, so we're coming up on our last few minutes. I'm feeling a lot of pressure here to pick questions, but um, we do. We would like to hear a bit about um, your your decision to run for office, what that looked like, and then we have a question from Adele Franzblau. I'm not sure if you can ask your question, Adele, which I think will kind of wrap this up nicely. All right, let me, let me, you want me to answer the question first and then have Adele or you want me to answer them both? Sure, sure. Hers is going to kind of bring us up into future. <laughs> All right. So um, I just, you know, I, I ran against Thomas Road, who was a great guy. Um, Thomas was 82 years old. He had been in office for 26 years, which was longer than I had been born. Before he was in the state house, he was chair of county council. Before he was chair of county council, he delivered the mail. And before he delivered the mail, he delivered the milk. It's a true story. So he literally knew everybody. Um, I felt like Bamberg, Barwell, and Orangeburg weren't even growing stagnantly. They were declining. And so I ran. And I challenged a lot, especially the young people, and especially the women on this call. We need more women in South Carolina politics. I mean, we just do. That's a fact. I don't know how I'm approved to be a fact, but I truly believe it to be a fact. We just need more women involved in South Carolina politics on every single level. Um, and so I just, you know, for me, I... I wanted to, to, to change South Carolina. I believe not in what it was or what it is, but what it could be. And I worked extremely hard for eight years to do that. And um, I have absolutely no regrets. It was a true blessing, that experience to be able to serve in the South Carolina General Assembly. And I, I look around and I came in with some, some good old folk like Leon Stavernakis down there. He was a part of my freshman class, right? I love Leon, little Snackwell, we call him Snackwell. Um, don't, don't call him Snackwell. Um, but uh, he's just a great guy. Let me, let me also tell you who I serve real quick before we get to your last question. It's kind of crazy, South Carolina politics, because we really punch above our weight. But I was in the South Carolina State House with Mark Sanford, who was my governor, who ended up going to Congress. I was in the South Carolina State House with Tim Scott, who's a great friend of mine. I just did a Washington Post profile and said, I probably will never vote for Tim Scott, but I would give him a kidney. Like that is the weirdest thing. That's the, that's the best way that I can describe our relationship. Like I genuinely loved him. I would never vote for him. But if he called me today and said, Bakari, I need a kidney. I have two of them. I'd be like, Tim, I'll show up and give it to you. Um, I would, I served with Nikki Haley. Um, you know, I, I served with uh, all of these individuals who've gone on to, um, to, to, to do great things on the, well, to do things on the national level. Um, and so, you know, we, we definitely out punch um, our weight class. What's the last question? Um, Adele Franzblau, are you able to take hey, a Hi, can you hear me? Uh, thank you for so much for taking my question. I have to say, Bakari, I've been a huge fan of yours for a really long time. Um, I'm definitely old enough to be your mother. I have a son your age. I also would like to say I love hearing your kids in the background. That's just wonderful. That's all <laughs> we got right now because it's, it's their house. So yeah. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But my question is, um, what do you see for yourself in terms of um, uh, politics at the federal level? Because I sure would love to see you run for something. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I am unashamed to tell folk that, you know, my, my, my goal is to run for the United States Congress in the 6th Congressional District. Um, I'm excited about that opportunity. Um, you know, we, we're having a lot of conversations right now. Um, sometimes you can't wait in this circumstances. I'm waiting as long as possible and hope, hoping that Congressman Clyburn will um, retire at some point in time. Um, and people, the next question I hope you would ask me and the question that I would have to answer is why? Why would you run for Congress? And my answer is, is it's a lot like the reason I ran in 2006. That's the fact that um, where I'm from in our communities, from Charleston all the way up to Richland County, we have hospitals that are closing. Um, it's economically stagnant. 
um, if not declining, more businesses are leaving than they're coming. We still have a corridor shame. Kids going to school where their heating and air don't work, their infrastructure is falling apart. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be someone who has big and bold ideas. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens and we'll see when that time comes. But I'm excited about the possibility. I think that district is gerrymandered to all hell. I mean, that's part of, that's a, you shouldn't have a district that goes from MUSC to USC. Um, <laughs> that just that, that doesn't make sense to anybody, but that's what we have. And so I can't wait to have that opportunity. I don't think it's going to be a, as big a field as people imagine it to be. I, I just I believe it's probably going to be myself and, and probably his daughter. And we'll see what happens. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, we're getting close to the end of our time. We do have one more student who has a question and we do try and make sure our students get a chance to speak up. Mary, are you able to take yourself off mute? Mary? Yes, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Yes. Awesome, yes, thank you for taking my question. Um, I was just thinking, you know, as you're talking and I'm not the most involved in politics, I'm actually a geology major, but um, there's a lot of important science science and politics as well. Um, as a member of a younger generation, especially living in Charleston, you know, I feel a lot of camaraderie um, and less racial and cultural division. And it just struck struck out to me that you were saying, you know, change isn't, isn't initiated in Washington. Um, but I was wondering if you have any advice on how to get Washington to hear us, you know, because I was really frustrated and almost felt failed by the last election. I know a lot of my friends did too with both of the main candidates being old white men, you know, and it's, yeah. it's just like, I feel this divide between, you know, my generation and the people who, you know, run the country in Washington. And I'm wondering if you have any advice on what we can do to close that, uh, close that gap and uh, make our voices heard and the voices of those, you know, less fortunate heard. Well, the first thing I'll tell you, Mary, is that your question and the way that you posed it was rather refreshing. And so keep that, keep that honesty and keep that refreshing tenor um, as you go forward. I, I believe in your generation a great deal. Um, other than the fact that you guys call yourself Generation Z, I think you need some branding and marketing help. I think Generation Z is a horrible name. It sounds like the end of the world or a bad movie or something. We're, we're Zoomers now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, but you, your generation is phenomenal. Just two or three years ago, we were worried about you guys eating Tide Pods. And now you all are transforming gun laws in the country, right? After Newtown, I was somebody that was very cynical. I thought, Mary, I was like, look, if you can go into a school and kill 20 little white kids and gun laws don't change, gun laws never will. And your generation proved me wrong. They proved me to be a cynic and they proved me wrong because the Parkland kids and many high school students and kids your age marched around. They got reform at Dick's. They got reform at Walmart. They changed laws on a national level. And so a lot of us are looking to you. I would say that one of the things that you have to do, Mary, though, is while you're in school, utilize that platform to go outside of the gates, right? You know, those little kids who sell the flowers and the roses and stuff, just sometimes even saying hello, or if you feel more comfortable going to an elementary school, or middle school, because there are a lot of young people in Charleston who would do wonders simply, and you would help so much simply by them seeing you, because they don't see many people who are college students who have been able to, who, who care about them. And so going and being that example is first. And then I would tell you to get politically active. I, I know that people are going to hate when I say this, but I don't care, Mary. You can very easily be on the Charleston City Council if you're a student at the College of Charleston. You got a political box right there. You got, you got a whole electorate right there, but even get involved. Go listen to the city council meetings. Go listen to the school board meetings. You know, let this be your playground. Let this be your laboratory since you're in science. Let this be somewhere that you can hone those skills. So then you don't have to be 40 years old to change the world. I tell the folk that all the time. You can be 22, 23, 24, 25 years old and change the world. And so I'm not gonna give you too much advice. I'm gonna be here for you to help lift you up and say that this might be an opportunity there or that might be an opportunity there. But other than that, I'm going to watch you lead because young people are doing it and every ounce of change we've ever had in this country hasn't been led by those same people that you're talking about. From the gay, white, from the gay rights movement to the women's rights movement to the civil rights movement, they've all been led by young people. 
And so I anticipate that that won't change with your generation. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, well, I think it's time for us to all come together and thank Buk Bakari so much for giving us our, his time tonight. It was really, it's been such a pleasure and an honor speaking with you. Um, I'm so inspired by your work. I know we all are, and we really can't wait to see what comes next. So for all of you joining us, if you don't already, you can follow Bakari on Twitter. You can listen to his new podcast, The Bakari Seller Show. And of course you can always tune in to see him live on CNN. And of course you should go buy the book. Uh, paperback coming out soon. So um, thank you so much. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, also, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Pearlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture, the Avery Center uh, for African American History and Culture, the Jewish Studies Program, the African American Studies Program, and Southern Studies Program. I'm so glad we could make this work tonight. Okay, so thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great night.